one of the more disappointing seasons in Lakers history. And obviously, you know, people get a little upset that we give the Lakers any time considering how dysfunctional they are and the fact that they're not in the playoffs. But it's still LeBron James and it's a big deal. And the Lakers are a big deal. And we're in the midst of their very important offseason in trying to find a new coach and deciding what they're going to do with this lineup, which obviously does not work. And Jeannie Buss did a, an interview with Bill Plaschke this week where she talked about you know, her responsibility as an owner and some of the people that she is going to be getting advice from. And Phil Jackson is one of those people. And obviously Phil knows, you know, has forgotten more about basketball than I'll ever know. But that doesn't mean that he is the right person to make a decision for the Lakers at this point. And Bill Plaschke had some interesting insight into Phil Jackson's thinking for the Lakers future. I've heard that Phil would like LeBron traded. I've just heard that, but I've got no, nothing to back that up. No on the record stuff to back that up. But I think Phil, I know, I, I do know that Phil would like them to keep Westbrook and try to make it work with them. So I don't know how Lakers fans as a whole feel when they hear that. I will speak as a non Lakers fan. I don't think that's a good idea. But for multiple reasons here. So, uh, I mean, starting with the fact that I, I don't even want really Phil's opinion getting out. Phil does not work for the Los Angeles Lakers. He is not the GM of the Los Angeles Lakers. Obviously, Phil has deep roots with this team. But because you were once a part of something does not mean that you should have any sort of heavy weight in the decision of this magnitude. And here's the next problem that just happened with this speculation even getting out. If they do, for whatever reason, trade LeBron James, Phil Jackson is now going to be the person that is blamed or is going to hold responsibility for that decision, even if it wasn't his decision. And this is what happens when you have too many chefs in the kitchen. There's too many opinions being weighed here. Everyone, every friend does not need to have an opinion. When you're in a serious relationship, there is a, there's a, a pretty understood rule if you want to have success in that relationship. You can't get advice from too many people and everybody can't know your problems. What happens when you start doing that? As soon as you start telling this friend and that friend and your mom and your aunts and your cousin and their friends, oh, we're going through this, we're going through that. Well, now everybody knows and everyone has an opinion. And when it doesn't work, no one's going to take responsibility for it not working, but everyone's going to have a say in what happens. You can't have this many people giving an opinion. And in my, from the outside looking in, my perspective on it is that this is unethical. Phil's not responsible for anybody in that building. He's making choices, or not choices, but he is, he's giving strong opinions to the owner of the team, and Jeannie Buss, who has a, he has a very long-standing relationship with, a very serious relationship with, about people and their future that he does not have to answer to. He doesn't work for the Lakers. It's one thing to get a passerby opinion. Hey, what do you think about this player? You think he fits what we do? You think his personality fits our culture? What do you think about this coach? You, you think his style will work with the players we have? That's one thing. But to talk about adjusting your roster at the level of trading LeBron James and keeping Russell Westbrook, whether this is true or not, the speculation of it even getting out is so dangerous and the implications of what could happen from that are catastrophic. There should not be this many people giving opinions about the Lakers. One person. The GM should be making these decisions with the consultation of Jeannie Buss, who should not be making basketball decisions, which she has said she doesn't want to make basketball decisions. She makes business decisions. She is the final say. You ask Rob Palinka. Rob Palinka makes the decision. Who, whatever happens, happens. And then you know who to hold responsible for what's gone on with the Lakers. Magic Johnson, Phil Jackson, the Rambuses, other advisors, LeBron, Clutch. How many people have to wait? And, and it's not even, we're not even hearing about Rob Polinka. How many people have to weigh in on this situation? I just think it's insane. I think it is really, really a crazy way of doing things. You cannot have this many people weighing in at this level on what's going on with the future of the Lakers. Trade LeBron James? Even if this wasn't Phil's idea, like the fact that it's out now, are, are we supposed to hold Phil Jackson responsible if LeBron James is not with the Lakers anymore? He doesn't even work for the Lakers. I don't know. Let's get to Natalie Egadolf, 76ers reporter. 
Uh, also covered the Raptors for, four se for three seasons as well. Uh, Kelsey, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm sure you are exhausted after what was a wild night there in Memphis. Okay, so let's start with this. Um, Steph had a little comment. It's been a very chippy series, a lot of trash talk exchange, some, uh, some serious moments, and obviously we'll talk about Ja in a moment. But Steph had a little, you know, a little jab before, before the game, saying they were going to whoop that trick. Um, and it did not happen. The opposite happened, in <laughs> fact, <laughs> at the highest level. Um, did you guys hear about that before the game? Like, did the players hear about that before the game? So we talked to the players after the game, obviously, because that happened after media availabilities with the Grizzlies. And some of the guys, I would say most of the guys, other than Dylan Brooks, who doesn't go on social media, said that they did see it. But they also were very kind of close to their chest, coy about it, because, you know, after the game, they know that they still have to win game six. They still need to win a game seven. So they didn't want to go too high or too low. But I would be surprised if that didn't motivate them a little, because all season long, Joy, we have seen that these guys take things personally. Uh, they're all, you know, 21, 22, 23 years old. So they use that chip on their shoulder and they're always kind of looking for what can motivate us. And, and they've used that literally since the beginning of the season. They'll see one thing. I, even it goes back to Jaw, was it last year or the year before where someone had tweeted at Jaw and said, hey, like Jaw doesn't look like he has it anymore. And then he had a huge game and referenced it in his post-game interview. That is just the culture that this team has. They're looking for ways to motivate themselves. So I would be very surprised if, Steph putting their own words against them didn't motivate them a little extra yesterday. That's fine. I like that. Whatever other, you know, extra motivation that you can find uh, to get up. Obviously, they're going to bring it every night. But if you want to put a little extra spice and seasoning on it, I'm, I'm cool with that, too. For those of you who don't know what Whoop That Trick is, it's a song from Hustle & Flow. Uh, it's a film. It's based in Memphis. Uh, go Google it. We, we, we have more interview to do. <laughs> so obviously that's a, that's a big element in the arena and the fans certainly know what's going on and they're on social media and they're already fired up because of how this series has gone. So we were talking before you came on, it was, it was quite the scene in there last night. So the fans want to do with that trick. As soon as you do that, that means the game is done. So the quicker it happens, obviously the better the game is going for the Grizzlies. They started chanting that in the third quarter. And Jaron, we talked to him after the game. He said he was laughing. He heard it. He wanted to hear it earlier, apparently. But then when it actually came on, I would say midway through the fourth quarter, which it, that's, that's very early, but of course the Grizzlies were up by 40 or 50 points. The crowd went the loudest I have ever seen a crowd. And I've been to NBA arenas. I had NBA social sitting beside me and she said the same thing. And the, I don't know if you guys saw this on Twitter either, but, uh, Al Capone, who's the artist who sings that, he actually got on the microphone and said, Steph Curry, in your face, whoop that trick. And then, yeah, you're seeing the video here of Draymond Green getting into it. Steph Curry was laughing. He made a, he made a comment after the game, Steph Curry, like, you know, when you're down by that much, you got to find some way to have fun. You got to find joy. So I, I think Draymond, you just, he's a lovable villain. Even that, he's taunting them, he's trolling the crowd. But how do you not just smile? How do you not have fun with that? No, I loved it. I, I, th that is exactly how I describe him. He's a jolly villain. Like he is not, <laughs> he is not somebody that um, you truly like hate and wish for, <laughs> you know, bad against. And he plays that role perfectly. I think it's genuine to who he is. Um, and it's really played a huge role in this series. Now I, I will be honest. I did not think that Memphis had a chance in that game last night. I thought that the Warriors were going to go out there and take care of business as the championship level team that I thought they were playing at. And that is not how it went. It went the complete opposite of that up by 55 at one point in the game. So what does this, what does that win tell you about this Memphis team or tell us, because obviously you're with them. Yeah, I think it did surprise a lot of like national media who hasn't seen the Grizzlies all season. Uh, I will say this, this entire series it's crazy to think the Grizzlies have led for 182 minutes. The Warriors only 58. That's a wild, crazy stat to me because I think both teams could look at this and say, you know what? Two games have been blowouts, one for each team. The other three games have come down to one or two possessions. So either team could say, you know, we should be up. We should, we should have four already, or it could be flipped at three and two. I think what it tells everyone else is that not only is this team deep, but this team does not give up. Defense is ingrained in this team and they they got old kind of grit and grind mentality style of play that the old Memphis Grizzlies had this team still embodies it they just play a completely different style they've preached next man mentality 
all season long, battling injuries with a couple of their starters all season. Dylan Brooks played two or was out two thirds of the season. Ja was out 25 games in the regular season. I think it's just a credit to to the culture that Memphis has built here over the years. And I think a lot of that has to be with, you know, not being scared of your opponents, not being scared of big moments. You saw Desmond Bain not scared of LeBron. He said something about, I'm not scared of your big steps earlier in the regular season. And I think that also goes back to just Coach Jenkins instills this this confidence in each one of his guys. And so when it's time to step up, even if you've been out of the rotation, someone like Brandon Clark, who was completely out of the rotation, has stepped up and had a huge playoffs. It's Coach Jenkins. That's where it starts. He instills this confidence in these guys from number one and jaw to number 15 in Jarrett Culver. We're talking to Kelsey Wright Johnson, Grizzlies reporter, was there last night and uh, the crowd was wild. So obviously John Morant was there courtside as well. And he was certainly involved in <laughs> in, in keeping his team uh, energy up. But what is the latest on his injury? Obviously wildly disappointing to not have him out there. But are we going to see him again? How is it looking with John? Yeah, so officially he's doubtful for the rest of the postseason. Uh, Coach Jenkins did get asked about it after the game last night because he's continued to say doubtful we're going to reevaluate he was asked again um if he, we'd see him at all in the postseason even if the grizzlies were to move forward and he said at this moment he is still doubtful so the grizzlies have said you know it's it's a non-surgical repair or recovery and so they're they're obviously very hopeful that jaw or confident i'll say they're confident that jaw comes back fine next season but i think they're they're 